Hi, I'm here today to give you an episode and a comparison, a versus video that I am probably just as interested in as you are in the results of this because when I first heard the announcement of the 35 to 150 millimeter F2 to 2.8 VXD from Tamron, my mind immediately went to the possibilities of replacing some kind of combination like the 28 to 75 and the 70 to 180 millimeter with one lens when I'm shooting an event or shooting weddings or portrait sessions, you know, kind of the generalized settings where I use a lens like these. And of course, you know, if you're talking about the possibility of traveling and your idea of traveling includes, you know, professional grade F2.8 lenses, well, this becomes a pretty easy alternative there to consider. But I wanted to dive in and give you a little bit of a deeper dive on what the pros and the cons of both approach, the two lens approach versus the one lens, and whether or not this lens can actually compete optically with these two very excellent lenses from Tamra. Now, just so you know, I've got demonstrated here both the original 28 to 75 millimeter F2.8 RXD, which is known as AO36 in Tamron speak. I have the new, I'm just finishing up my review of the new 28 to 75 G2 lens, which is the AO63. And and then of course the 70 to 180 you're familiar with and you've probably just seen my review of the 35 to 150. So first of all, let's just look at some basic specifications in terms of size and weight and cost. And so start, let's start with the cost factor, 1899 US dollars. So in Tamron terms, that's a really expensive lens. In fact, it's the most expensive lens I believe that Tamron is currently selling. And so by comparison, uh, Tamron has been really, really generous in a much improved 28 to 75 G2, which you'll see coming up shortly in my review cycle compared to the original, but the cost is basically the same. Right now, if you're looking at B&H prices in the US, 879 US for the original, 899, $20 difference US difference for the G2. Now the 70 to 180 currently retails for 1199 US. So that's a total if I'm going to take the two newest options here because I see no reason why you would choose the older lens at this point for a $20 difference. So that's $2,098, $2,100 we'll call it versus $1,900 for the single lens option. Again, this is a large and heavy lens by Tamron standards, 1,165 grams here. So that compares to 540 grams for the 28 to 75 and 810 grams for a total of 1,350 grams. And so again, just looking at the raw numbers, if you're not considering just a single lens, but two lenses, our price point is about $200 cheaper to buy the single lens and our weight difference is about 200 we'll call it roughly 200 grams difference between the two in terms of weight so either way we're not talking about a radical difference in terms of price nor in overall weight if you're you know counting every gram for packing so i don't know that either one of those factors is enough to tip the scales so I'm going to give you a little bit of a breakdown of pros and cons. Let's give you pros for the 35 to 150, then pros for the combination. Then we'll take a quick look at uh, image quality comparison and then give a final uh, verdict there at the end of that. First of all, however, a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that sets you free from the bulky traditional wallet while also making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them, thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. Visit phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. You can even customize your wallet with new accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even the Chipolo tracking integration if you're the kind of person who loses their wallet. Use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. So here's some reasons why you would consider or should consider the 35 to 150. First of all, when it comes to the build and the handling of the lens, this is in another class compared to these other lenses. I, when I go back and forth, 
uh, it's just, it, it's not a comparison. The uh, 70 to 180, the action of the rings, just the overall feel of it, feels like a much, much cheaper lens than what we have got with this lens. Whether you're talking about the damping and the feel of the zoom ring, the focus ring, and then just the general all, general feel of the lens in your hand. Now the 28 to 75 is more similar to the 35 to 150, not as feature rich, but definitely a vast improvement over its predecessor in terms of build and handling. But this is definitely top of the heap. This is the premium lens and it feels like it in the hand. There's also no comparison when you're talking about features. Uh, early on, Tamron's approach to Sony has been very much a Spartan approach to where it's all about the quality of the optics and the autofocus, the performance of the lens, less so about the features of the lens. And so in the case of the 70 to 180, the only thing you've got on the barrel is a lock and uh, no switches, nothing like that. In the case of the 35 to 150, you have got focus hold button in multiple positions. You have got the AF-MF switch. You've got the, the locking mechanism for a zoom lock. But then you've also got this switch with custom modes that allows you to choose between three different custom modes. There is a weather sealed USB-C port. And Tamron has a new set of software uh, that you can download for free, their lens utility, where you can tweak all kinds of aspects of behavior. I mean, I'm talking about serious tweaks, like you can control which direction you want the manual focus ring to focus in. You can control how much focus throw you want there, whether you want it to be linear or non-linear. Uh, beyond that, I mean, you can also choose to handle this to where you can switch between functioning as a manual focus ring and then as an aperture ring. You can, uh, you know, program other things like preset, you know, focus throws or a preset focus position that you can dial up. There's just a whole lot of versatility that is there. Now, I will note that the new 2875 G2, it does have the focus hold button. And so it does allow you to program a little of that functionality, but what it doesn't have is the multiple custom modes that allow allows you to you know change even more behavior um, you know and have all of that accessible at one time as opposed to being able to maybe program one or two things that you can control through the focus hold button here so definitely very feature rich lens and again in a whole other category of performance I did feel just as a general impression as a photographer that the kind of richness of the images was a little bit better from the 35 to 150. We're talking about a, a kind of unique contrast and color pop, the way that those two things coordinate that just give images that extra special look to them. I think the three-dimensional rendering is maybe a little bit nicer here. And so um, we'll, we'll talk more about image quality in a moment, but just as a general impression, I really, really like the image that come out of this, I think in a, in a tier above what I've seen from these previous lenses. Though, uh, as we're going to see, the 28 to 75 uh, is definitely for this class of lens. It is really, really improved as we're going to see. Uh, it's, the other thing that I think is, is a huge advantage here is the versatility of a one lens solution. Well, that's a, a big deal, obviously, if you know, you're know you not wanting to change lenses or maybe if you're wanting to shoot a, a wedding or an event or porch session, you know, to not lose shots because you didn't have the right lens attached or, you know, you were constrained by your zoom range. That's a huge, huge thing. And if you're someone that likes to shoot with two cameras already, it means that you can cover, you know, basically all the basics in this lens and then maybe choose something a little bit more extreme um, to augment, to give you just kind of those specialized, like maybe a really wide angle look, for example, uh, to augment what you're not going to get out of standard zooms in that kind of way. So so I, I do think that that is an advantage. Obviously, there is an aperture advantage here, and that's particularly true compared to the 28 to 75, where with this lens, you basically have an aperture advantage all throughout that zoom range. A really significant one on the wide end, f2 versus 2.8, but even by the time you get to 75 millimeters, you're still at f2.5 as a maximum aperture versus f2.8. And so there is a tiny aperture advantage relative to the 70 to 200, but by the time you get to about 85 millimeters, that's lost. And so it's not as much of an advantage comparing, comparing it there, but it still is an advantage that you have throughout a lot of the of the range. And of course, you know, price and weight, it slightly favors the single lens solution. Though again, that's a maybe a minor detail here at this point. 
So let's talk about pros for the two lens combo. First of all, obviously you're getting seven extra millimeters of width on the wide end with the 28 to 75 versus 35 to 150. And of course you're getting an additional 30 millimeters of reach on the telephoto end, 180 versus 150 millimeters. That could be very significant and that may be enough to tip the scales in the favor of going with a two lens solution. Obviously, if you're just kind of focusing on the camera in hand at the moment with one or the other lens attached, it is going to be a lighter. And so if you just want to use one of the lenses, you know, you're going to have no, no matter which one you use, they're going to be smaller and lighter mounted on a single camera. You definitely get better magnification figures with either one of these lenses versus the 35 to 150. It's not bad, but these are very, very good. And so that's certainly an advantage. I would say um, perhaps in tracking situations, and I didn't have a chance to, you know, hardcore test sports. I don't consider any of these to be true sports lenses, particularly when you talk about third parties on Sony. You have a bit of a disadvantage in that you don't unlock the maximum burst rate of Sony, kind of their sports body either the A9 series or the Alpha 1. There's a third party limit of 15 frames per second. Whereas for example, on the Alpha 1 that I use, I'm filming on right now, uh, you can get 30 frames per second with a first party Sony lens. So I kind of look at sports as still being the, the, the domain advantage of, of Sony first party lenses. And so probably if you're wanting to, you know, get something for sports purposes, your best option is actually going to be probably the new 70 to 200 millimeter G Master Mark II which is probably going to give you your best performance. And so maybe a little bit better tracking, but I, I certainly, as far as just generalize the kind of stuff you're going to do for weddings or events, I don't think that there's any difference between any of these lenses. You're going to get roughly the same kind of combination. But again, if you know, you might get a little bit better tracking with this lens than you would with this lens. So there are a few just kind of generalized things. Let's dive in and see how they compare optically and then we'll come back for just a little bit of a wrap up at the end. So we'll start by comparing both the AO58 at 35 millimeters with a AO63 at 28 millimeters. Um, now, wide open f2 versus f2.8. This is 200% magnification, 50 megapixel Sony Alpha 1. So we can see looking in the center of the frame that the lenses look very, very similar, both of them wide open, with maybe the tiniest contrast edge going to the 28 to 75 G2. Now, in the mid frame, I think that situation reverses with the 35 to 150 looking a little bit better. Down in the corners, however, it's definitely the 28 to 75 that has the win. Now, even if I stop down to f2.8 for an apples to apples comparison in the corner, the 28 to 75 is still better. However, the mid frame now favors the 35 to 150 even more so, and the center of the frame um, now looks even better on the 35 to 150. We can look at one other spot here, and you can just see that I would say overall outside of the very corners, the 35 to 150 has the edge. Now, if we go on to 35 millimeters on the 28 to 75, comparing them both at f2.8, we can see that both of them look fantastically good in the center. Again, I'm going to very, very slightly edge the 28 to 75 in the center. In the mid frame, though, definitely the wind to the 35 to 150 and down into the corners. Um, it, you know, again, it's not a radical improvement, but I do think the uh, 28 to 75 is a little bit better. So if we move on to 50 millimeters in both lenses zoom range, uh, we can see f2.2 versus f2.8 in both wide open. So with at that stage, there's a little bit more contrast for the 28 to 75. They're both very close in the center of the frame. In the mid frame, it's again very close to a wash, but a slight edge to the 28 to 75 G2. And down in the corner, uh, again, kind of a similar performance, a little bit more contrast for the 28 to 75 resolution is pretty much a wash. Again, though, we have the opportunity to stop on down to f2.8, which does give a little bit more advantage back in to where they're roughly equal now in the corners. In the mid frame, a little bit of an advantage to the 35 to 150. And in the center of the frame, both of them are fantastic. Um, so I'm just going to call it a wash between the two. Moving on to 70 millimeters, again, just a one third stop advantage here, but uh, at f2.5 versus f2.8. In the middle of the frame, 
The uh, wide open advantage goes to the 28 to 75 in the center, which definitely has the edge here. In the mid frame, the two lenses are roughly equal, no real advantage there. And into the corners, again, about equal, maybe the slightest advantage here for the 35 to 150. If we stop it on down to f2.8, however, we can see that the advantage now goes slightly to the 35 to 150. It's a little bit better in the mid frame. In the center of the frame, the two lenses are closer, but the 28 to 75 is still a little better. So if we flip over here and now we compare at 70 millimeters the 35 to 150 with the 70 to 180, we see that the 70 to 180 is a little bit sharper in the center of the frame, though contrast is not necessarily advantaged. In the mid frame, however, it's a little bit of a reversal here and we see that the uh, 35 to 150 is maybe a little stronger. If we move on to the corners, I would definitely give the advantage to the 70 to 180. And of course, now there is no real advantage in stopping down. It's going to have to compete uh, at wide open, just like everything else. So if we move on both lenses to 100 millimeters, we can see in the middle of the frame that the advantage goes to the 70, or excuse me, the 35 to the 150. That just has a little bit better contrast in the mid frame. We can see that it definitely has the win there, just better contrast, better acuity overall. And if we move down into the corners at 100 millimeters, again, I think the 70 to 180 is outperforming in the corners. Now, if we move on to the end of the zoom ranges, 150 millimeters versus 180 millimeters, looking in the center of the frame, the wind definitely goes to the 150 that is, or 35 to 150 that has, you know, noticeably better contrast and a little bit better sharpness. In the mid frame, that advantage continues, though it's, it's closer here in the mid frame. And down into the corners, the two lenses are very close with a slight advantage for the 35 to 150. So how about the overall rendering comparing these three lenses? We can see here that our focus is not identical here, but I do think that there's a little bit of a sharpness advantage for the 28 to 75 versus the 70 to 180 with both at 75 millimeters. But if we look down into kind of these busy sections here, you can definitely see that the 70 to 180 has a little bit of advantage in overall softness and just kind of the generalized, um, just kind of feel of the image. It has a nicer blur to it with the 70 to 180. So if we go and we compare the 35 to 150, of course, it does have an aperture advantage here. And so again, focus isn't identical, but you know, it does have a little bit better contrast and I think a little bit richer color. And that's something that's just kind of a general observation as well. Also, if we look in these areas, the bokeh is just a little softer and more, more pleasing on the 35 to 150. You can just see a little bit rounder geometry here towards the edges of the frame. And as we move up into this kind of defocused region, it's just a little bit creamier and softer on the 35 to 150, which definitely makes it the winner in that regard. You can see, look at the images globally here, that the 28 to 75 is definitely the loser here in terms of the softness of the bokeh. Look how much softer it is here. And just popping back in here for a moment, we can see that the resolution difference is very similar between the two lenses, uh, both delivering you know really nice looking color and uh, saturation levels. Let's do a similar experiment here, but in a even more challenging scene here. And so in this case, our plane of focus is down, you know, very near the edge of the frame. So that provides its own kinds of challenges. But there's also some potential for these kind of prismatic effects, a little bit of chromatic aberration possibilities. And so what we can see is both of these lenses control chromatic aberrations really, really well. I mean, just no issues there. But what I note in some of these areas here is that, first of all, I think the color is ever so slightly richer on the 35 to 150 and also it's just a little bit softer in rendering some of these diff difficult areas here in terms of the overall bokeh as you look here it's it's close but it's just a little bit softer for the 35 to 150. Now, if we compare down here with the 28 to 75, I would say it has even a little bit better contrast here near the edge of the frame. It also, however, has a little bit more fringing, as you can see, and also it's not as soft in some of these difficult areas. And so it's just going to be prone to a little bit more kind of generalized busyness than what the 35 to 150 is, whereas the 35 to 150 just gives us a little softer bokeh rendering. 
That's true also if we move to a different kind of subject here. And, and so here at around the 50 millimeter range, we can see that the uh, two lenses look very good. You can see just a little bit more of that fringing on the 28 to 75. But if we look over here in the bokeh, you can just see it's softer from the 35 to 150. Geometry is just a little bit better. And so overall, just the image, the, the background here is a little less distracting. Now to give you a little bit more of an apples to apples, I went ahead and stopped this down to f2.8. So there's no actual physical aperture advantage, but we can see now that the variance in chromatic aberrations is even more pronounced. And we can also see that the bokeh is still favors the 35 to 150, softer, rounder. And if we you know zoom back out, just a little less eye catching by comparison. Now one final comparison, if we put both lenses at 150 millimeters, uh, that being the 35 to 150 and the 70 to 180, zooming in here, we can see that both of them do a very good job of controlling uh, uh, chromatic aberrations, even a little better for the 70 to 180. Um, and so there's a marginal advantage there. Over here, I would say at the end of the telephoto range here that you know, I would say there's a tiny bit of an advantage maybe for the 70 to 180 in some of the rendering here. It's just a little bit bigger and softer. However, looking at things globally, you can see in this area that the amount of distraction there is kind of similar and uh, just, you know, just generalized image. Both images are really, really sharp. They look really, really good. But I would say there's just the slightest edge for the 70 to 180. So pretty interesting when you break down the optical performance for a single lens with a broader zoom range than either one of these lenses, the 35 to 150 obviously holds up really, really well optically against these very good competitors, which remember that these competitors have held up very well against, you know, the G master competitors in the past. And so that's a pretty fantastic performance when you consider you're getting all of that out of one lens. There's some give and take that we saw there along the way, but certainly there is no like, you know, tipping of the balance really in either direction with either one of these lenses in terms of sharpness and contrast test charping, test charting. I would say as far as the generalized bokeh rendering, I do favor the 35 to 150. Now we saw that there was at least one situation where the 70 to 180 was a little bit better, but I would say if you're taking the sum total of performance across the zoom range, I think that you're getting an advantage from the 35 to 150. As far as the order of chromatic aberration resistance, I would say the 70 to 180 is the best, 35 to 150 second, and then the 28 to 75 is in third place. Now, when it comes to flare resistance, that is the optical shortcoming here. Though, as we're going to see, at least, you know, trying to recreate that for an actual test is a little bit hard to do. But as we can see across these series of shots, there's slightly more flare artifacts with the 35 to 150 compared to the others. And, uh, but again, you know, it's really going to kind of depend on the shooting situations you put it in. I found a pretty wide variability of the amount of flare I got with the 35-150, really depending on how I composed and the unique lighting situations, the focal length that I chose. And so I will say, however, I think that there is a little bit of an advantage for these two lenses versus that. But at the end of the day, that's about all that I can point to. And remember when it comes to the optical comparison, I didn't use the older version of the 28 to 75. I used this brand new, like super good version. So the fact that, you know, this is comparing positively with that is, is really, really huge. So at the end of the day, I don't think that there is a wrong answer here. I think it really depends on your shooting priorities and needs. But I certainly can say this. I do think that many photographers could replace a two lens with a one lens solution in the 35 to 150 and not feel like they're really giving up much. And particularly if you have something wide angle to augment, you know, or if you have a serious telephoto for, you know, greater reach that 30 millimeters it is it is significant i don't want to downplay that 180 millimeters is longer than than 150 millimeters but of course some of that advantage has already been lost from uh, tamron if this went all the way to 200 millimeters it would be a different story but you know at the end of the day i don't know that it's enough for what i'm going to do that it would be the deal breaker so just to let you know what I've chosen to do. I'm electing to go with the single lens solution. I really like the 35 to 150. I like its versatility. 
and I'm not you know put off by the size and the weight so for me I think it's going to be the path that I choose moving ahead your mileage may vary of course you know it may it's maybe more than a $200 difference um, you know by the time you actually sell off lenses to purchase another very often you lose money in that process so if you've already got two lenses here hey, maybe you wanna hang on to what you've got. But hopefully this gives you a little bit more information to make an informed decision for yourself moving ahead. I've got linkage to all of these uh, lenses uh, reviews down in the description down below. Also buying links if you'd like to purchase any of them for yourself. There's also linkage there to purchase my merchandise, follow me on social media, become a patron, sign up for my newsletter. And of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.